Good morning, Mountain Movers Church family. How's everybody doing today? I give just a little bit better than you did for Brandy. It's a competition. Um, so uh, we have been in this series, Ready for Anything. I hope that it has uh, been a blessing to you. Today we are in part six. What could possibly be, in our opinion, this is the most important message of the series, but it is possibly the most important message you will ever hear in your life. Okay? I'm going to say that again. This is... Quite possibly the most important message you will ever hear in your life. So I want you, if you don't take notes normally, you should today. Okay? Grab out a piece of paper. Grab out your phone. Don't get on Facebook other than to share. Listen, jump on Facebook, hit the share button, and share this message. Because though this room right here is pretty full, there's hundreds and thousands of people that are your friends and your contacts on Facebook that if you hit share, this could change their life. All right, we are going to move today to Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And this is interesting because this is where we've been a lot in this series, Matthew 24, which is where Jesus basically set his disciples down and he began to help them to understand what were the signs of the end times, all right? Now, our Bible is broken into chapters once it was canonized. And so you don't realize that 24 and 25 were both the same setting. So it was all the same message. It was all the same teaching. 24, they said, Jesus, tell us about the signs of your return. And then 25, he said this. Now, let me tell you how you can be ready for when I return. All right? So today, this message in part six is simply entitled this, Are You Really Ready? Are you really ready? Guys, we live in a world where the enemy likes to distract and distort. He likes to cause us to compromise. He likes to cause us to look at other people and compare them to ourselves rather than us comparing ourselves to the only absolute truth, the Word of God. And so today I want you to search your heart. Am I really, really ready? We're going to answer this question for you. How do I know? How do I know I'm ready? All right? So go to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm sorry. I'm trying to catch the time. There we go. The... the um, Lights are bright. All right. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Jesus, in this passage, in 25, he basically teaches his disciples through two parables. A parable was what? It was a story that Jesus told his disciples to help them understand a much, much deeper truth. Okay? So we're going to look at both of these parables, and we're going to give you two ways, just two, because I want you to remember this the rest of your life, two ways that you know you are ready. Matthew 25, verse 1, it says this. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. That would mean 50%, right? Can we do a little math in the room? All right. Keep that in your mind. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. They were not prepared. The wise ones took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep, or they got distracted, okay? At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, they trimmed their lamps, but the foolish ones said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. They said, no way. They, there may not be enough for both of us. Instead, go to those selling oil and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10. But while, they were, uh, but while they were away to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready, say ready. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came, Lord, Lord, they said, open a door for us. This is the most important verse in this whole passage. But he replied to them, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. The first way that you know, 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 that you are ready for the rapture of the church, when Jesus comes back to take his bride home, the way that you know you are ready is one easy statement, and that is, know Jesus. Now listen, that is so simple.
sinful that it can go right over your head. No, Jesus, I do. I know you. Anybody ever seen the elf? That was the best impression I've got. You guys should really laugh. Help me out when I'm funny. <laughs> I know you. That's what he said. I know him. I know him. Dang it, I get it wrong. It's I know him, I not know you. Him. Okay. He wasn't there yet. He was coming the next day. It was Santa. I love the elf. <laughs> Santa's coming. Santa! Oh my God! I know him. It's him. Okay. I know him. That is a better impersonation than I had. Get Not you. It's him. All right. That is what I want you to do. When somebody asks you if you know Jesus, all right, I want you to do what Brad just did. Yeah. You have to know Jesus. But listen, that word no can kind of throw you a little bit. Because when we think about the word no, we think about knowing about someone or about something and that's actually not the actual meaning in the Greek or the Hebrew the word actually means it is gnosko if you'll throw it up for me so they can see it is gnosko in the Greek and it means this to personally intimately and experientially know someone or something I see a lot of phones going up you should take a picture because you got to get this listen to me it's not enough that you know about Jesus it is not enough that you come to church, that you've added your name on the roll in someone's building. It's not enough for any of that, okay? I know people who literally say, I know the Bible. Why do I need to go to church? I know all those stories. I've heard all those stories. Listen, you can know the entire word of God backwards and forwards, but if you don't live the word of God and you don't have a personal, intimate relationship, you don't know my Jesus. You know about him. But it is about personally experiencing him. And so this morning, we're going to give you, within this first point, seven ways that you know that you know Jesus. All right, listen to me. So often we go, hey, I want to pray that prayer of salvation. And you should pray that prayer of salvation, all right? That's the first step. But that's not the only step. Because when you first meet someone and you're introduced to someone, I don't have any experience with them. Okay? There's many of you, I've met you, but I haven't had much experience with you. Others of you, I've got some stories. I can just point you out in this crowd, and if I had time, I could tell some funny stories about experiencing life with you. All right? And so I want to give you seven ways this morning that you know that you know Jesus, that you've got that intimate relationship. So number one is this. You admit you are a sinner in need of a savior. You admit. So many people, they miss this part right here. If you don't believe you're a sinner, there's no way that you actually have a relationship with Jesus. Because to be a sinner means that you understand Romans 3.23, all of us, every single human being that has ever walked the planet except for Jesus, we have all sinned. What is sin? Sin literally means to miss the mark. We miss God's standard. There's no one of us that can live up by our good works to the standard that God has. So we realize that when Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross to pay the penalty I should have paid because sin is literally a debt that has to be paid to God. All right? Because we don't live up to his standard. We can't be in his presence even though he wants that relationship. It's only because of Jesus. So step number one is admitting I'm a sinner. And for those of us who are perfectionists, that's tough, but you got to get past it, all right? I have to admit I'm a sinner. Number two, you have to believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. In the day and age that we live, this is huge. We live in a day and age that says, you know what? All roads lead to heaven. All religions lead to heaven. All beliefs lead to heaven. It is not true. The Bible says in John 14 and 6, Jesus said himself, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man, no one is coming to the Father except through me, except through the sacrifice, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do any of us have the right to stand before God Almighty in a relationship only through Jesus? You have to know that. You have to believe that. Number three, you confess it with your mouth. It's not about a head knowledge, okay? It's not just a knowing, it's not a head knowledge, it's confessing 
with your mouth. Romans 10 and 9 says this. If you openly declare, that is a confession, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So around here, many times when we talk about salvation, we talk about ABCs of salvation. And I'll encourage you, memorize this in your mind. If you ever lead someone to Jesus, it's that simple. Admit, believe, confess. Pray with them that prayer, they are saved. Now we're going to move a little bit farther because so many people stop at that. I prayed that prayer, I'm golden, check the box, I'm ready, my ticket is bought. Listen, the word of God very clearly helps us to understand that after salvation, there's life change. After salvation, there's life change. So number four is this. Your life has changed since accepting Christ. I want you to ponder this for a moment. My life has changed after accepting Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new has began. Listen, the moment you get saved... You don't change overnight, okay? But what does happen is this begin to have this stirring. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit is what we call it. There's this stirring in your heart that when you do something wrong, okay, when you sin, when you miss the mark, when you know you've displeased God, there's something inside of you that you feel bad, right? You feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. And what the enemy wants you to do in your mind is be like, let it go. It's no big deal. Everybody does it. It's no big deal. The fact is, when the Holy Spirit begins to nudge you, that power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit is what begins to realign your life with your old man into your new man. All right? Moving you from the old into the new. But if you ignore that little voice, if you ignore the urging of the Holy Spirit when he begins to say, man, don't do that. And you know what often has to happen is you go, God, forgive me. Man, I never felt bad before when I said that. I never felt bad before putting somebody in their place. Why did I feel bad now? Like, I've always been a witch. What's wrong? Now I feel bad about that. You know what I'm saying? It's the Holy Spirit working in your life. Let him do the work. Realign. Brad, do you have any stories? <laughs> okay, well, you threw me on. off when you talked about being a witch. I thought, now you're just on a glorified Hold broom. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I... He is on one. I'm sorry. I told him when we get to this point. Here's I'm, why. Hold on. No, no, no. I'm no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm next. Listen. I, I told him when we get to this point, I'm going to pause and you take it. Because I said, why do you want me to take it here? Because you got way more stories in that department than <laughs> I do. <laughs> she said, you've done all sorts of bad things. So you're going to share with them all the bad things you've done. No, really, uh, when I came to Christ, I'm just going to be honest. I had a filthy, filthy, horrible mouth. My mind was corrupt, just full of lust and anger and judgment, just critical towards people, bad attitude. And when I came to Christ, like you said, it was, it was a progressive work of faith. I remember when uh, I just got connected to the church that I was in, and they had this uh, open gym night, and we were playing volleyball, and, uh, you know, God made me highly competitive with no athletic skills whatsoever. <laughs> And it's a really frustrating combination because, like, I, in my mind, I'm like, I am going to dominate, and then I suck really bad. <laughs> so the ball comes over the net, and I diving, very not athletically, diving and totally, completely missed it. And I'm sitting there face down, and, and I think at the same time something came out of my mouth. And it was a really bad cuss word. And, and the whole room was silent. <laughs> and like all, I'm thinking, I just cussed right in front of all these church people. <laughs> I'm trying to go in life right. And you know what? Here's how they reacted. They just started dying laughing. They thought it was so funny. And that's the way the church should be because we come broken and God puts us together. Sometimes it just takes time. And, we're, and we never come to that place of perfection where we're, we're just broken vessels being used for his honor and for his glory. But I also love the scripture that says that Jesus said, um, they will know that you belong to me. He said two things, by the way you love one another, but also by your fruit. So if, if you imagine yourself as a tree, you need to ask yourself, what kind of fruit am I bearing in my life? 
can other people that you work with, if I were to ask them if you're a Christian, what would they say? Because I've asked people, hey, is so-and-so a believer? They're like, you know, I don't know. They're a really nice person. That's not what I asked. I mean, do people know that you're a believer? If, if they know that you're a believer, chances are you're living it kind of loud and proud and unashamed. And, and that's, that's one of the de- determining factors to know that you've really come to Christ and have that relationship with him. Absolutely. You know, you have to ask yourself, do I talk the way I used to talk? Do I go the places I used to go? Do I hang around the same people I used to hang around? Because I'll just be same honest. music, same movies. Exactly. Has your mind changed? The the more you you the more you get closer to God, the more you want to please God, the more you're in the Word of God, the farther you get from all the things that you once were, the places you once went, because those things don't, aren't attractive to you anymore. The reason that people who are saved go to church, have you ever heard that saying? Like people will say, I don't have to be I don't have to go to church to be saved. No, you don't. You absolutely do not. But people who are saved go to church. Why? Because that's where God's presence is. That's where God's people are. That's how you can make a difference by getting into the house of God and using your gifts and talents. All right, number five. Number five way you know that you're a true believer of Jesus Christ. You can hear God's voice. You can hear God's voice. Now listen to me. So many people say, I just want to know God's will. Like, I just want God to speak to me. Listen, God is always speaking to his people. He is always speaking to his people. The question is, are his people listening? Because we keep ourselves so very busy and so very distracted that it's kind of like having kids in the other room. And you're like, hey, Ty, can you come here? Hey, Ty. That's what God wants to do to you. He's like, can I just have your attention, please? Listen, God's word is God speaking directly to his people. So the first place you start is not expecting an audible voice from Almighty God. Could he do it? Of course he can. He can speak through the burning bush like he did to Moses. But normally he doesn't. This is how he speaks. But if you don't ever open it and you don't actually read it, you're never going to hear from him. He's not going to do it for you. you got to get into his word. But at the same time, that same Holy Spirit that begins to make you feel bad, if you'll listen, he'll speak to you in your heart and in your mind. I remember so many times in my life just having this feeling like you should go talk to them. Uh, and then you start getting sick at your stomach. When I was a teenager, like, I don't think I should. No, I think you should. And when you start having that feeling, that's the Holy Spirit. Because the devil doesn't tell you to go tell somebody else about Jesus. And when you start getting nervous, that nervous feeling, you know that the Lord is speaking to you. And the closer you get to God, the more he does that. The more you'll just stop. Get on your knees. Here's what I think is very sad in today's culture. All right? Keep your hands down. This is not a participation right now, okay? Too many people don't actually stop and get on their hands and knees and pray. We pray in the shower. That's great. Do that. We pray as we're driving. That's fabulous. You should do that, too. There's a lot of bad drivers out there. We pray as we go. We pray at work. We pray at school. All of that is fabulous. But if you want to hear God really speak to you, turn on a little worship. Get on your face and talk to Jesus. He will talk to you. He will speak to you. Whatever is going on in your life, he wants to be a part of it. But he's not. He's not going to play the games we play. He's not screaming at you. He's not one of those crazy moms. He's waiting for you to come because you want to be in his presence. You want to spend time with him. You want to have that intimate relationship. All right. Moving on. Number six. The way you know you're a true believer. You believe the word of God is absolute truth. You believe the word of God is absolute truth. Listen to me. 56% of Americans today, this is a survey by George Barna, this year, 56% of Americans today do not believe the word of God is absolute truth. Rather, we believe something called relativism. Okay? Let me just explain in a very, very simple way relativism. You and me, We're going to go play basketball, okay? You and me, we're going to go out on the court, and I'm going to make my shot, okay? 
And although I'm actually inside that three-point line, I'm going to tell you I just got three points. And you're going to say, no, you got two points. You were inside the line. No, I got three. No, I got two. Right? We go back and forth. Listen to me. Follow me for a second with this illustration. When you play a game that you know the rules to, we understand that outside the three-point line, you get three points. Inside, you get two. Free throw line, you get one. But relativism says, I can get however many points I want from any place on the court I want because that's the way I want to play. Follow me? So what relativism is, is you saying, you know what? What you believe is good for you and what I believe is good for me. But the Bible makes it very, very clear in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 that the word of God is inspired. Let me read this directly from this. All scriptures, say all. That's every page, okay? We don't pick and choose. I didn't write it and neither did you, okay? There's some things I don't really like, like don't grumble and complain. I kind of like to, you know what I'm saying? But it says not to, so we shouldn't. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Guys, this is how we change. Follow this scripture. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. This is absolute truth. We align our life with it, like it or not. Whatever you pick out in here and you say, you know what? Some of that I really like. But then there's a few things that I don't agree with. It doesn't matter whether or not you agree with it. What you have to believe is that from cover to cover, 100% it is true, and you align your life with it, and you live your life. That is how you know you're a true believer of Jesus Christ. Final thing is this. Amen. Give God a praise. Number seven, you love his church. You love his church. I'm not talking about mountain movers, although you can love this church. I'm not talking about a physical building. Building. I am talking about you love people. 1 John 4, 20 says this. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his fellow believer, that person is a liar. I didn't write it, simply reading it. For if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? If you say you're a true believer, listen, I get it. People do you wrong. Every one of us in this room can remember a moment in life where somebody did us wrong. But if you hold on to bitterness and you hold on to unforgiveness, the only person you're hurting is you. you got to let it go. Jesus died for them just like he died for you. We don't pick and choose. Can you say, Missy, that's hard? I get it. It's very hard. You get on your face and you begin to say, Jesus, take the hate out of me. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. And one day you'll wake up and you'll realize I don't hurt like I used to hurt. I've forgiven. All right? You got to move past that. True believers love people. They love his church. Amen. I want to jump back on that illustration because I, I love, that's such a powerful illustration when you're talking about you know, rules on the, on the court. You know, somebody designed the game of basketball. I don't know who it was. You can Google it. But whoever it was, they determined where half court would be. They determined where the three-point line would be. They determine how high that basketball goal would be. They determine how many people would be playing on the court. Every detail of the game, that person, that person determined exactly how the game would be played. And when, and when we talk about relativism, as people look at the word of God, the problem is so many people think that the, that the, the details can be twisted to our own situation. When the reality is there is a God, one God in heaven who wrote the word, his word, who breathed his word so that we would have a, a playbook, so that we would have the rules, the guidelines, the, the life plan for living the life that he expected us to live. And people look at these and they look at the scripture and they're like, I like most of it, but there's some things that I, I just can't swallow and I can't handle it. And I get it. There's things that I read in here when I apply it to my life, I don't like it because it, it makes me uncomfortable and it deals with my junk. I hate it, but I didn't write the book. So God is calling us to live a life when you accept him into your life and you make him Lord of your life, then you become subject 
to the playbook, to the way that he intended for us to live out the purpose that he's called us to for being on this planet. So in a nutshell, here's, here's today's message just wrapped up into two things. Here's two things that you need to know in regards to if you're really, really ready, to know whether or not you're really, really ready if Jesus were to come back today. Number one is know Jesus. Misty covered it beautifully. Know him. Not religion. We're talking relationship. Know Jesus. And two is help others to know Jesus. Here's, here's what I know. Over the years, we've seen a lot of hands go up for life change. Okay? A lot of those hands that have gone up, we've not seen their lives changed. But then there's those hands where you look at their life and they cannot shut up about Jesus because their life has truly been changed. And that's when you know. When your life becomes contagious, when you get into a real and life-changing what? Relationship with Jesus, you become contagious. Because you realize, like, I, I am holding in, in the palm of my hand the cure for spiritual cancer. And I'm not going to stand by and not tell people that I'm seeing around me in my life dying. They're dying spiritually, and I'm not going to share the cure for spiritual cancer with those that I work with, those that I love, those that I went to school with. I'm not going to share. Absolutely, I'm going to share. So when you really come to Christ, here's how you really know. You become contagious. You just got to tell somebody. You're like, hey, listen. And, and, and honestly, it, it, you become so contagious that you're like, I can't believe I just said that. Like, you become bold and courageous because that's the spirit of the living God inside of you being stirred up because he wants more than ever. He's like, I died for these people. I need you. I need you. I need you to be contagious and, and to get out and to tell people and to share the power of your story. Every one of you that have had an encounter with Christ, you have a story. Why aren't you sharing it? You have a story to tell. Tell people that you know who Jesus is. Get contagious. I want to share a parable with you in chapter 25. We have five minutes. Okay, I'm going to share this very quickly. In fact, here's your homework for tonight. All right, here's your homework this afternoon. I want you to read Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. It's a parable that Jesus told. And basically, there was a master with three servants, and he distributed money, all of his money to these three servants. And he left. He said, I'm going to give you uh, my treasure, I'm going to divide it up, and, and to one he gave five bags of gold, to another he gave two bags of gold, to another he gave one bag of gold. And, and then he came back and he said, I want to know, what did you do with the treasure that I gave you? What did you do with it? And the one guy that had five, uh, that had, uh, five bags, he invested it, and it grew and he was like, you're awesome, man. You have done so, so good. The next one with two bags, he did the same thing. The other one that had one bag, you guys know what he did with it? He buried it. And, and the master was like, why did you do that? Why did you bury the bag? He said, at minimum, you could have taken it to the bank and just let it accrue interest. And I would have made a little something on my investment. But instead, you buried it? And here's what he told that the other two. He gave them even more. Because they had taken the treasure that he had given them, and they made it multiply. He made the best of what he had given them. But the other one, he cast them out and put them to death because he, because he didn't take advantage. Here's what he said in verse 26. You wicked, lazy servant. What do you think of? What is a servant? One who what? Serves. One who serves. You, li you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. I'm going to read the last uh, two verses here so you really get the context. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more. All right, listen to this. And they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me explain this parable to you in a nutshell. You are on this planet to fulfill an assignment given to you by God. I really want that to sink into your spirit. Here's, here's what has broken my heart. I'm going to be very transparent with you as a pastor. As I, as I pray for you guys every week, I pray for this church. I pray for you guys so much. I see faces in my mind. 
and I see people who, they, get, they got the first part right. They know him. They have an intimate relationship with him, but they're not using their time, talent, and treasures to make him known. We get so distracted by life. What is that statistic? What is it? George Barna said, yeah, uh, in a survey conducted by George Barna, 66% of believers believe that their purpose is personal happiness and to live a healthy, productive, and safe life. That was taken in 2020, too. In 2020. Let me read that again. 66% of the church believes that their purpose for being on this planet is personal happiness and to live a healthy, productive, and safe life. Is there anything contagious about that whatsoever? When you come to Christ, you immediately have, have signed up for a mission, an assignment given to you by God to make Jesus known, to use your time, your talent, and your treasures to make him known. The reason we push serving so hard, and it's not just about serving on the serve team at Mountain Movers Church. It's about using your time, using your talent, and using your treasures to help make Jesus. That's why you're here. Once you come to know him, that's the first part. But the second part is, guys, there are people dying and going to hell every day. Jesus could come back today or tomorrow or the next day. And we've got to be, when he returns, we all need to be busy, right, doing the work that he's called us to, to help rescue people from hell, from hopelessness, those who are hurting, those who need heaven as their home. We've got to take our time and our talent and our treasures and make Jesus known. The, the purpose of this message is not to beat you up. It, it is not to criticize you or judge you if you're not serving on the serve team, because that's not really what this is even about. Man, I know people that are part of this church. Uh, I'm just, uh, Janet, she serves in Joplin, and she serves uh, women who are hurting, and, and it has nothing to do with Mount Movers Church whatsoever. Uh, Nikki Bassett, hey, Nikki's here. Hi, Nikki, how are you? What's up, Nikki? She is amazing, amazing. Be the change. Have you guys heard of that? In, in Grove, they're doing so many great things for the kids. That is not a mountain movers thing. That's a Jesus thing. That's what we're talking about is use the time that God's given you and the talent and the treasure. And let's make Jesus known. That's what this is all about. Colossians 3.17, this is one of our favorite scriptures. It says, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That's our heart cry for you today. That's our heart cry throughout this whole series. Do you know him? And are you making him known? What are you doing right now with your time, talent, and your treasures to make Jesus known? Don't get caught when Jesus returns. Just building your own life to just be happy and make money. Once you, listen, it's the last thing I'm going to say. We're going to pray. You're here for a purpose. You are on assignment by God. And until you step into that, your life is never going to make sense. And you will never know what real happiness is. Real happiness is knowing Jesus and making him known, serving his house and serving his kingdom. All right? Um, plug before we pray. If you're not serving, if you don't have a place to serve, if you want to know more about it, you can go to our website, mountainmoverschurch.org. Click on serve. Uh, it's under get connected and there are lots of opportunities and there's opportunities outside this church just whatever you do get busy just get busy find something you love to do to figure out how to love people and share who jesus is through it and you're going to step into a sense of fulfillment like you've never experienced in your life all right let's pray today father we love you so much and um, we ask god that you would just stir the hearts of those that are under the sound of my voice today in this room and those watching online that may not have that intimate and real relationship with you like Misty and I spoke about today. I pray, God, that you would stir their hearts right now. Help them, God, to know that they're not ready. And I pray, God, that you would bring them to a place of repentance, a place where they just cry out to you and ask you, to forgive them of their sins and they believe that you're the son of God and they confess you as Lord of their life. In fact, let's do that now with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're in this room and you feel that tugging on your heart and, you, and you're like saying, Pastor, I, I know that I'm not where I need to be. I know that I don't have that real relationship you were talking about, but I, I want to pray that prayer right now. I want to make it right with God. 
right now. If that's you in this room, will you raise your hand if you're in this room? And we're just going to pray a prayer together. We're going to help you make that decision. I see your hand. Thank you. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're watching online, I want you to comment in in the comment section. uh, All in. If you're making that decision today. So church, let's pray this prayer with those in support of those that have made this decision. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess Him as Lord of my life. Help me to be ready for your soon coming return. And help me to let others be ready as well. In Jesus' name. Church, will you put your hands together and celebrate those who just made the best decision of their life?